Hi, I'm Jim Perko, the executive chef for Cleveland Clinic Center for Integrative and Lifestyle Medicine. And we're gonna talk about knives and knife skills today, okay? So, this is hugely important because no matter what diet you are on or what diet you're trying to follow, you still gotta know how to prepare it and make it. So knife skills are hugely important. To help you, we created a culinary medicine knife skill handout, okay? This is available for all our patients and it shows you all the parts and pieces of a knife. It shows you how to hold the knife in your hand and more importantly, how you hold the food in your other hand. And then it goes on to show you how to use that knife in the motions of cutting properly. So now I'm gonna explain that physically how you could do that. And so I have an assortment of knives here because Ideally, I tell everybody you want a big knife for a big job and a little knife for a little job. So I'm just gonna go over on some of the different knives, starting with the main one that we use. So the main tool for knives is a chef's knife. This one is eight inches, meaning it is eight inches from the heel to the toe. Now this particular knife has a half bolster. And what I mean by a half bolster is that it is thicker and reinforced at this top part. So you could see how thick it is on the top and halfway down it starts to taper to the same thickness from the heel to the toe when you go to cut and more importantly go to sharpen it. A knife with a full bolster however is thick and reinforced all the way down to the heel of the knife. The reason they used to do that or make those knives is because it could also serve as a cleaver and you could bust through and chop through a chicken bone right? A lot of people don't do that today. And plus the downside of having a full bolster is when you're doing a lot of cutting like this, you could get a little divot inside here from wearing the wear and tear on it, but it won't wear and tear the end of it. So you'll have a little divot in there. And when you go to cut like this, you might be cutting from here to here, but this part over here, you might not be able to cut through because it had divot. Unlike, when, so to sharpen it, you would have to put this on a grinding wheel and grind it down so you could get rid of that divot. Unlike a, this knife that has a half bolster, you can literally put it on a steel or a stone and sharpen the entire length from heel to toe on a stone or on a steel, and that way you'll get a nice sharp edge throughout the whole knife. Okay, so the other knives are a good knife to have is a slicing knife. This one is a hollow ground, which means it's got air pockets between it, right? And that allows food not to stick as easily. You can also get a hollow ground in a chef's knife as well. So here's a chef's knife that's hollow ground. Here's one that isn't. Again, those indentations in the knife create air pockets. So if you wanted to slice like through a potato and this knife was damp with some water, it would more easily slice through the starchiness of that potato without sticking because you had the air gaps in the hollow ground of this knife. Another important part is, is you wanna have a sheath for your knife. So you don't wanna take a good knife and just put it in a drawer with all your other kitchen tools, instead if you put it in a sheet like this, now it's A, it's safer, right? But B, it also protects the knife as well. And then you can put it in the drawer and store it with all your other knives. Then we have an offset slicing knife serrated, which is a good tool to have. Slicing through tomatoes or bread, but because it's offset, it's less fatigue on your hand and your wrist. And then here's two different styles of a boning knife. This one is curved, hollow ground, so when you're boning like this, it matches the contour of the blade and the knife with the motion in your hand. And then this one is a flexible boning knife, meaning you could get closer to the bone if you wanted to bone out a piece of fish. And then lastly, we have a small paring knife. Again, a big knife for a big job, a little knife for a little job if you were doing strawberries, this would be a better knife to do than a larger knife. So 
we'll go through in, few, in other segments on how to sharpen a knife and how to cut. But this is the main introduction on the types of knives and we'll go further on how you'll use them coming up. Hi, now I'm gonna show you how to cut and how to hold the food in your other hand. But before I do that, I need to show you about the cutting board first. So if you have a plain cutting board on a table like this, you need to have something wet underneath it because if you don't, it slides really easy and that is not safe. So what you want to do is we have some wet paper towels here. You could take a cloth towel, a paper towel, you just wet it. It doesn't have to be dripping wet, just damp. We put that down on the table. Now when you put your cutting board on top, it doesn't slide and it's stationary and that makes it a lot safer. So you don't want this when you're cutting. You want something that doesn't move on you. Okay, so now we're gonna start with a piece of celery. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you how to make a slice and then a strip and then a dice. So if you have something that's long, you could cut it in half. Now to make it easier for you to handle, Again, you don't want to hold the knife like this. You want three fingers on the handle, thumb and index on the blade, like choking up on a baseball bat. The other important part to mention before we start slicing and cutting is that a lot of people, a lot of patients come in here and they like to cut with the tip of the knife because they're doing this a lot. And if all you do this, and you could try this at home, if you pick up your knife, and you press down on the tip and you go like this, all these muscles are tense and tight. And if you did that for a long period of time, you could get fatigued in your arm. Instead, you wanna cut with the back part of the knife, and if you stand relatively straight, good body posture mechanics, and you cut on the downswing where the back part is actually hitting the cutting surface, all this fatigue is gone you don't have any more. So that's really important. Now, how you hold the food in your other hand is huge. So again, you want to indent your fingernail under your first knuckle. So you got to think of it this way. Your hand should be, you, if you hear my nails on the table, or if you hear me scratching this cutting board, my nails are actually touching the surface and that's what you want. If you're holding it on your fingers tips like so that's not good because that's how you could cut your fingers so again you want to make sure that you hold your finger where the thumb is behind your cutting finger and the blade touches your knuckle the very first knuckle above your fingernail so I'll give you an example and I'll do a slice of this celery really slow so look, if I cut on the downswing, I pick up, I cut on the downswing, pick up, but I'm always on my knuckle. I'm not holding the food like this. Instead, I'm holding it like this. That is really important to get those slices. I'll go again really slow. Again, I'm holding the piece of celery just like this. My knuckle is protruding beyond my first my, my, my first knuckle is protruding beyond my nail and it's touching the blade of the knife. I'm cutting on the downswing. I pick up, my knife never leaves the cutting board. I cut on the downswing, pick up, cut on the downswing, pick up. Again, on my knuckle, cut on the downswing, pick up. I'm cutting with the back part of the knife really slow and that way I'll get perfectly nice thin slices every single time. If I want to cut a thicker slice, all I got to do is just move my finger back and now you could cut a little bit of a thicker slice, okay? If you want to make a slice the same way, you would just go and cut down and then you would get a slice of celery. To get a strip, you take your slices and you cut them into strips and we refer to that as a julienne strip. So let's do that again. We got a slice, I'm holding it well. 
and then I'm going to take that slice, cut it lengthwise, and now I got a strip. To get a dice, we just cut crossways, again, on my knuckle, I am always on my knuckle, and I cut on the back part of the knife, and I cut on the downswing, and that way I get perfectly nice dices every single time. Now, when you want to clean this up off your cutting board, you could just do like a karate chop motion. The blade is scraping the cutting surface, and you could pick up, and it goes right into your pot or bowl or whatever it is that you want to put it into. Same thing. Now, that's how you could get a nice thin dice or a thin slice, right, or a thin strip or julienne strip. Now that wasn't hard because the celery doesn't really move on me. It's a lot harder if you have something like a carrot. Okay, so if you want to do a carrot and get dices, rather than cutting the whole one, it's better off to start with a chunk that's more manageable. But here's the thing about a carrot. A carrot moves, so it could be more difficult to get that first dice and slice. So what you want to do is you want to stop it from moving by cutting an initial slice. Now when you go to do that, there's a couple ways you could do it. When you cut, you could cut down like a guillotine like that, or if you're able to hold it, you could saw while you go down. I'll try to do both ways and show you. So, you could saw like so, and then you get a slice, or you could just put the tip down like so and press down. Okay, so now we got two slices. The slices again the same way. You would make a strip like so. Then you take your strips and you cut them crossways and you will get your dices. Scrape up and you put that in and you have your diced carrots. Okay, all right. So now, Another cut that I could show you is an oblique cut. An oblique cut is a double bias angle cut. What I mean by that is that the first bias is I take my knife and I tilt it this way. The second bias, I tilt it that way. Both of them are at about 40 degrees. Now, what we'll do is think of it as sharpening a pencil. So if I want to get consistent size pieces, I have a thick part on top and it tapers down to a smaller part. But if a, an oblique cut, this double bias cut, is similar to like sharpening a pencil, and I'm going to do that on the carrot and show you. Because if I did slices, I'll have big slices on one end and small slices on the other. Because the diameter at the other end of this carrot is smaller than on this side, right? So. Double bias, you hold, I'm on my knuckle, I take my first slice, I cut it, and I go right through the center on the second slice, right through the center on the third, on the fourth, and I keep turning, and I have a point just like that as if I was sharpening a pencil. So now, I keep doing that as I turn the carrot all the way around. While I'm on the thick part, I could keep the angle of my knife the same. But as the carrot starts to get near the tip and the end, I'm going to take my knife and angle it a little more to compensate for the smaller diameter. So when I do that, I will have consistent size pieces. And that is really important because in cooking, consistency in size equates to consistency in cooking because big and small doesn't cook the same, right? So now I'm at the tip, I'm making my slices a little smaller, and you could see, now I could get same size pieces from one end of the carrot all the way across. And this is another thing that's really important. This is a classic stir fry because these carrots roll around. Flat carrots would just sit in a pan. But if you had these in a pan and you went like this, they'll actually move and roll on you because that's a, an oblique cut. It's a classic stir fry cut. Okay, so you got to see what some oblique looks like. Those are stir fry cuts.
And then again, a julienne would be, first you take a slice, and then now that would be your sliced carrot, and then your julienne strips would be taking it and cutting those slices into strips. So if you want a large dice, you would take a large slice and then cut it into a large strip and then crossways into large dice. Medium for medium, small for small. So this is the first basic element of cutting a carrot or celery and how you hold the knife in your hand while holding the food in your other hand. Again, very important when you do that, you want to indent your fingernail under your first knuckle so the knife is touching your knuckle. You want to really practice so you're not holding the food like this because that's how you could cut the tip of your finger. And again, always try to cut more with the back part of the knife, not with the front. And you could cut on the downswing like so. This is much easier when you have foods that are softer like celery. And even the carrot's not hard because it's small. We're going to show you coming up on how you could cut larger items. But for now, this is how you would do And we use onions and celery and carrots and a lot of things. Next up will be how to peel and cut an onion. Hi. Now we're going to show you something really important. How to peel, slice, and dice an onion. Because an onion is in a lot of stuff, a lot of recipes, right? Really important. So here is the first step, okay? Which really is a paper towel, okay? So what I'd like to do is, on my cutting board, even before I begin, I'm going to put a paper towel on my cutting board. Now I take the onion, goes on the paper towel. And basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut each end off like so. So I hold the onion as tight as I can, right? Cut each end off. I put a little slit in the side and I'm going to peel that into this garbage can that is next to me. Now I got a clean onion that is fully peeled. But why did I do it on a paper towel? Here's why. Because this onion was in the bin at the grocery store with a whole bunch of other onions. And no one knows who was touching it and what they were doing. Most people don't take their onions and wash them before they put them onto their cutting board. If you would take that onion and put it on your cutting board directly, you just cross-contaminated the surface of your cutting board with everything that was on that onion. And then now you could just take your scraps and you could wipe off your knife. Or what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to walk over to sink, rinse off my hands in the knife real fast. And then now that way I have a knife that is clean. I have a cutting surface that is clean and my hands are clean and I drastically reduce the risk for any cross-contamination. I also do the same thing with garlic, right, which I'll show coming up. So now we have our full onion. Okay, so all the, an onion has a core. There's the core. We're going to slice through in the center of that core. So we got our half onion. Now. What you do is, in culinary school, the way they teach culinary students, the way I was taught, is that they'll take the knife and they'll put little slits in like so, going all the way across, maybe one or two this way, and then they begin to slice to get their diced onion. That, I get so many patients that come in our teaching kitchen, and they have a hard time doing that. So in culinary medicine, and this is a culinary medicine teaching kitchen, the way I teach our patients is how to get perfectly diced onion every single time. That's easy for them to learn. And that's what I'm going to show you now. So instead of doing the way I was taught in culinary school, this is how I teach our patients to do it. 
because I find they're able to grasp it and get it a lot easier. Everybody could peel it like I just did and then cut it in half. Now all we're going to do is we're going to take a slice and slice our onion. So again, I'm on my knuckle. I'm holding the knife, three fingers on the handle, thumb and index on the blade. While I'm on the knuckle holding my knife, I'm just going to make a slice, a little sawing action, and then I just slice through my onion. So when you go to slice your onion, the slices are half moon slices. I'm going to cut with the back part of the knife, and as I slice my, dice my onion, slice it crossways to get a dice, I'm going to slightly pivot my onion. So I'll do this really slow. I pivot and I cut on the downswing. I am on my knuckle and I keep turning this slice of onion. And when I do this, I get perfectly diced onions. Beautiful. And I find it is a lot easier for people to do it this way than trying to hold this tight and go like that. So now we'll do it again. And anybody could take their onion and slice it like so. Now, when you get to the part that's an end, what you could do is, if it's too hard to hold an end like this, all you need to do is make a bridge with your hand, put your knife, go right into the center, and you cut down while you still had that other slice to hold. Now you go through, and so you have your, your diced and sliced onions easily. So, again, slices, half moon, you cut through to get easy dices. You could stack the slices if you're comfortable. If it's too thick for you, all you do is just use a couple, one or two slices, right? Again, now to clean this up, and this is important, because you don't want to have a lot of stuff on your cutting board because it's not safe. So again, a, a clean cutting board is a safe cutting board. So we scoop, karate chop, and it goes into our pot or whatever we want to put it into our bowl, karate chop, scoop, pick up, and again it goes in, right? So now when you want to clean as you go is always a good practice in the kitchen. You never want to work in a clutter. So again, we'll do that really slow, half moon slices, cut with the back part of the knife. I'm pivoting as I go. And why it's so much easier to pivot that way because if you have a half onion, you just can't go like this because this would be a large, thick slice, right? Instead, that's why you have to go all the way across. So when you do it this way, you got to hold it and you got to cut through all the way like so. But it's also, you got to be careful that you're not cutting all the way through at the very tip. Otherwise, all, everything's going to fall apart on you. And this is the way they teach in school. This is the way I would talk. And when you do that, You'll put, after you go all the way across, they'll put a couple slices sideways in here, and then they'll slice down and they'll get their diced onion that way. But it's so hard for people to hold this end because it's falling apart as, it, as they're slicing through. And a lot of patients have difficulty in doing that. A lot of people have difficulty in just how to hold any food in this hand. So, if we, I learned by teaching people this way, they could do it so much easier because it's easier just to take a slice like so, right? Once they got the slices, if they just pivot that slice while they cut through it, they get a perfectly diced anytime, right? So here's our perfect diced onion. It's so easy to do. Again, karate chop, pick up, and you get your onions that are nice diced for whatever it is you're trying to make. So here's our, we'll just finish this onion so you could see. Okay, we pivot as we go. All right, our last slice. And so now you'll see you have perfectly diced onion from beginning to end, okay? Now, if you want to do slices, a julienne slices, you could just go straight across like so, right? Or you could do the same thing and just slice all the way down and you'll get sliced onions this way. They do stick together so you would have to pull them apart like if you wanted to do sauteed onions for grilled onions, right? And then 
That way, your onions will have nice little strips. Now, for the garlic, okay, the same thing on the garlic. I always start with a paper towel, okay, and I always put my garlic on the paper towel for the exact same reason I did with the onion, okay? So now, here's the thing what's important about garlic. A lot of people, once you take this garlic clove and you break it off the head of garlic like so, you get those papers. A lot of places teach to take this garlic and smash it like this. Well, when you do that, you release the oil. Now the research and the science shows that if there's a benefit to garlic, it's in the oil. And if you release the oil by smashing it this way, what happens is the oil's released, it sticks to the paper, the paper sticks to your finger, and you're losing what science says has the benefit. Instead, what I do is I, while I'm on the paper towel for the exact same reasons of the onion, not to cross-contaminate my cutting surface, I cut down, but I don't cut through. I just cut enough and I pull back my garlic clove, just like so. And then I do the exact same thing on the other side and what happens is I could literally rock out my garlic clove just like this and I have a whole clove of garlic and here is my onion peel. And now my garlic contains all the oil. Now I could put the clean pieces of garlic on my cutting surface. I clean off my knife. And now if I want to chop my garlic, even in a garlic press a lot of times, you could lose part of the oil in the press, which means you're losing what sciences has the benefits. Again, I'm on my knuckle, back part of the knife, I'm going to slice this thin, thin slice, this garlic, like so. And now you can see the oil that stuck to my knife because I released it. Now I just give it a little rough chop. Again, I'm always on my knuckle. And now you could take the blade of your knife and um, you could literally smash this garlic with your knife like so, just like that. And now I'm really releasing the oil. And I'll have fine minced garlic. I could even turn this into a garlic paste. Now I hold my two fingers, my index and my middle finger on the tip. And I, with my other hand, I lift the knife up and down. And I'm able to give this quick rocking chop. I clean off the knife. You can see how the oil is really released now. If you want a paste, you could continue to smash. Now, to capture it all, I could scrape that whole surface and I get all the oil and capture most of what science says has the health benefit. And now you have fine minced, fine chopped garlic every single time. So, next up will be how to cut through a hard squash. Hi, now we're gonna show you how to cut through a hard squash. A lot of patients that come in our culinary medicine teaching kitchen have difficulty, they love squash, they wanna use it, but they have difficulty cutting through it. So, I specifically got a large butternut squash for this demonstration. And, it, and I'm a little bit taller, I'm about 5'9", so, I have a little bit of height that makes it a little bit easier for me if I stand on my toes to get some pressure down on top of this squash. But for people that are really short, it could be more difficult. So I'm going to show a couple ways. If someone is a little shorter and they need to, you know, try to cut something hard, if they stand on their tippy toes and it gives them a little bit more height, it gives them a, the ability to put more pressure as they cut down. Okay, so first off, on a butternut squash, and this is a really nice one. I could throw this in, this is just a bonus tip. When you go to shop to buy one, this is the kind you wanna buy, right? Here's why. It's got a small bottom and a big top. Cause right about here 
is from here down is hollow. It's the seed cavity. From here up is solid. So if you're making a soup that calls for 46 ounces of butternut squash, you're going to have a, be a, have a happier time cutting one that's got a big top and a small bottom rather than a big bottom and a small top because this will be filled with seeds, hollow, and there's, the flesh is really thin because it's all hollow inside where this is solid and it'll be easier to peel, cut, and dice. So first off, now when you have it, when you got something really hard like this, you could use the guillotine approach. And if you use a guillotine approach, what you would do is, if you stand on your toes, you wanna put a cloth towel on the tip of the knife and you get this seated into the squash and when you're on your toes, you could press down and put pressure like this, okay? Because the taller you are, the more you'll be able to put force versus if you're like this trying to do it, it'll be much harder. That's one way. Another way is you could do the slicing action where you're going down while you slice. So example, this is gonna be the hardest part of this whole squash. This one's gonna be the hardest to get the first slice because it had the stem, which is close to here, right? Which will make it harder. So if you hold the knife again, three fingers on the handle, thumb and index on the blade, and this is only an eight inch span. If you had a lot, like a slicing knife, you got a longer span to saw through, but you could do it with this one. So if you need to get it seated in first, you could just put the knife where it is, make sure this isn't rocking, try to have it where it's on one of the creases where it's a little more stable, and just give it a tap with your hand to get it seated in. Now, all you gotta do is just keep slicing. As you can see, I'm not pressing down really hard, I'm letting my knife do the work. So I'm going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And as I go, look, I'm, hard, I'm going really soft, and now you get your first slice. But that's why this one was harder, because it had the core. Now we're going to do the exact same thing on the opposite side. Okay, we're just going to give a slice, same thing. So now this was the bottom, but a little easier to do because it didn't have the core. Now right about here is where the seed cavity is going to be. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm holding it firm with my hand. I'm letting the knife do the work. And you could see, and that was a good catch. This was a perfect slice. Here's why. This is hollow, but you could see right here where I cut it. If I put my finger in the middle, right now it looks pretty solid, but it's actually not. Because watch what happens. Right boom in the middle, it's hollow. It was that easy to do. I could press as hard as I want, that's not gonna happen here, okay? So now, we wanna finish peeling this. So this could be a good peeler. Some people tell me they try to use like a potato peeler to peel this. That could be really, really hard to do. So I'm gonna try to show you how to do this, okay? So we'll put that there now. First off, again, thumb and index finger on the blade, three fingers on the handle, hold it tight, and in a rocking motion, I could just give clean swipes all the way down, and I got a peel. Now I could see where the end line was. Now that's an indicator how deep in I need to go on the next one, and I do the exact same thing all the way around. And if you do it, Right, once you get the hang of it, you have clean swipes all the way around this squash. And you could see I'm letting the knife do the work. I'm going back and forth in cutting motions and my whole squash on this part is now peeled. And they were solid peels, okay? Which, by the way, if you want to practice doing strips, you already paid for these. So you could practice your slicing and your dicing, if you want, by taking these into slices and then cutting them into dices. And it's a good way to practice your knife skills rather than just throwing these in the garbage because you already paid for them. Okay, now when you go to cut this in half, you will see 
it's all hollow inside with seeds. That's why you want a big top and a small bottom, okay? So now you would scoop those seeds out, then we would make slices, strips, and dices. Same thing on here. If you want to peel this, the same deal, you go all the way down like so, and just as we did on the bottom half, you get a straight peel. If it is too hard for you because this was too tall, then what you could do is just take it and cut it in half. Again, slice through, let the knife do, and you could rock it as well like this, and slice and let the knife do the work, and then now you have your squash that you could easily peel a little bit easier because it's much shorter and not as tall. So now once we get this peeled, like so, okay, we'll get all these peeled off. Then you could make, if you wanted to make butternut squash roasted fries or dice roasted, all you got to do is take a squash, hold it tight, make a slice by slicing, and then now you got a flat part, which makes it, so I always put it on the flat part, on my knuckle, same way again, let the knife do the work, and you make slices from your slices, you can make your strips, like so, and you could take these strips and make, you could season them, put them on a flat tray, like this here, and then you could take these strips on a whole clean flat tray and roast them. Or you could put them in an air fryer, right? And then that's a great way to have butternut squash fries. Or you could dice them. And then you could take your dices, put your dices for soups, or mix them with greens like Swiss chard, kale. And I like to do that a lot. So you got your salad, your slice, your strips, your dice. Again, you want a small bottom because this part, if you go through, you'll see it's hollow, right? It's got all this seed cavity. So I would take a spoon, I would clean this out, and then I would make slices or dices however I intend to use it. So that's how you cut through a hard squash. Next up will be chopping parsley. Hi, now we're gonna do something different. How to chop, in this case, how to chop parsley. So first off, we took fresh parsley, which by the way is loaded, loaded, loaded with vitamin C. And vitamin C is destroyed by heat, light, and air. So when you have it fresh and not dried or in a container, you're getting a lot of it. And that is so important to get vitamin C. And parsley is loaded with vitamin C. So we took it, we washed it, and then we dried it, right? So you could put it in a spin dryer and dry it, or you could put it in paper towels like this. Once it's dry, we picked it. Okay, so now I got fresh dried parsley that was all picked. It was in this paper towel, so it's nice and dry, all right? And so there, now to chop this parsley, here's how we're gonna do it. And there's a couple things in the kitchen. When you make a meal, you're not just making a meal, right? There's a lot of other modalities and important things woven into the kitchen making a meal. One, you get a lot of functional exercise because you're washing pots and pans and scrubbing, cleaning the table, shopping, gardening, pulling weeds, all those things associated with making a meal, right? And then you also get a lot of aromatherapy. When I go to chop this parsley, if I just take this parsley and I rub it between my fingers and smell, I can smell parsley. That's aromatherapy. These are things that are really important and they're great to smell. So now, <clears throat> I took my fresh parsley and I'm balling it up into a ball, like so, okay? Now, as I hold it into a ball, I'm gonna slice through it first. By doing that, I'm gonna be chopping a lot all at the same time because it's in a thick ball. Again, 
three fingers on the handle, thumb and index on the blade, I'm on my knuckle, and I slice through this ball. And by doing that, I already did some of the chopping, okay? Now, same thing again. I'm gonna do crossways. And I'm going on my knuckle. My knife never leaves the cutting board. And then I take my fingers and I keep bunching up the little loose pieces like so. Now when I get it to this point, look it, it's almost half chopped already. <laughs> and that's all I did, right? Now, again, to, I could go through it. I could do this one more time like so, go through, slice through it, and now I'm gonna put two fingers on the end of the knife, and I'm just gonna go and give it a coarse chop, up and down swings, back and forth, clean the knife, bring it in the middle, and keep on doing this. And now my parsley is pretty nice and well and chopped. It's that easy to do to get chopped parsley just like so. So, again, ball it up into a ball. First we took it, we took it off the stems, and we picked it, and then we took our pieces that we picked off, put them into a ball, we went through, gave them a couple slices, put some two or three fingers on the end of the blade, up and down swings like so, and then we clean it up, and you get beautiful chopped parsley smells great, highly nutritious, loaded with vitamin C. Next up, this was easy to do because I had a nice sharp knife. Next up, how you sharpen your knife. Hi, now this is the last piece of our knife skills demonstrations. So, Again, this was the main tool, eight inch chef knife, but it's also very important to make sure it stays sharp. A sharp knife is actually safer than a dull knife. So to sharpen your own knives, real easy to do. You don't have to send them out to stores where they charge, you know, to charge to sharpen your knives. You could easily do it yourself, okay? Um, and here's how, in case you want to do that. So, first off, I'm going to take some towels, and I have some water here. I got about four little paper towels, like so. And then I'm just going to put them in water to get them wet. All right. Bring it out so I got some damp towels. And just like the cutting board, I want to put the towels down. And now I have a stone. This is a sharpening stone. Okay, you can buy them in hunting stores or, you know, um, stores like Kohl's and Target even sell them now. Or you could get it, you could buy them online. A lot of places online sell them. And we're going to put that on our paper towels so it doesn't slide. Okay. And they come in different grits. So they got medium, they got fine, they got coarse. Okay. You would start with coarse and then work your way down through medium into fine. Or if you just have one, that's fine too. So... If there's a term called wet grinding, and that's actually kind of what I'm going to do. I'm just going to take some water, put it on my stone like so instead of oil. Some stones come with oil to put on, but oil could be messy and sloppy, and I don't want to do that. This is a steel that after we sharpen, we could put on the steel because this is a little bit finer. It's not coarse. It'll be like honing our knife, but it won't really sharpen a knife to sharpen it. You need to put it on the stone. So now we're going to take our knife. Again, I'm going to do three fingers on the handle, thumb and index on the blade. And I'm going to do it on about a 17 degree angle, like so. My stone is wet. And I'm going to make clean swipes that go from the heel to the toe, covering the whole length of the stone and the whole length of the knife at the same time, starting like so. And then I want to do even swipes on each side of the knife. So again, I start at the heel on about a 17 degree angle, and I go down to the toe. That's the whole length of the stone, the whole length of the knife, and I got, that's five. And then I turn it over and do the same thing. Heel to toe, 
the whole length of the knife, the whole length of the stone, that's four, and that's five. So when you do that, and you go to wipe it off, you'll be able to see in your knife actually where the thickness of you were scraping against the stone. So the length of the knife, the length of the stone, even swipes on each side, and then you could take it, you could wipe it off, and you'll see exactly how you did. So if you got waves in there, you weren't holding it steady enough. If you got a nice, consistent strip, you did a really good job. Then to hone it, you could actually go on the steel, because it's finer, and you could do the same thing. They have these guards down here. You always make sure your finger is beneath the guard. You're going to do the whole length of the steel, the whole length of the knife, the same way on the stone. So you start at the heel, you finish at the toe, like so. If that's five, I do the same thing on the other side, and the exact same way. And that's how you use the steel, and that's how you sharpen a knife. Why is all this important? Because the knife skills, the cutting, it's really important that if food is medicine, then anytime you eat anything, you're either feeding or fighting disease. So when you do your own cooking, you could control the foods and the choices you make. So you could choose to make the foods that fight disease and not feed disease. We tell that, the way we refer that to people is, you want to love the foods that love you back. It's easy to love the foods that don't love you back, but we want you to love the foods that love you back. And what's going to love you back could be different for everybody. If you have celiac disease, gluten is not going to love you back. But no matter what diet you are on or follow, if you're on a diabetic diet, a cardiac diet, a Crohn's diet, a celiac diet, it does not matter because your food should still taste good. You want to be able to enjoy your food. And to do that, if you increase your culinary literacy, and we have programs that talk about culinary medicine, it's a culinary medicine teaching kitchen, and here we teach how to make foods moist without fat, sweet without sugar, savory without sodium, bulk without grains, density without meat, how to cook with oil or without oil, right? So how to cook with little salt or no salt. These are all important, but the most important is taste. You want to love what loves you back. And this is so important because food is so important. And it is not just eating. When you're in a kitchen, you get functional exercise from all the cutting and the chopping that you do, lifting pots and pans, scrubbing pots and pans. You get a lot of aromatherapy when you, I chopped the parsley earlier and I smell that parsley. So when I chop the garlic, I smell that garlic and that is aromatherapy, right? Especially all the smells when you cook and cinnamon and ginger and all the wonderful smells. They create food memories that are formed in childhood and carried for life. We all have them and they're wonderful memories to have. Most importantly though, we want to show you how to create memories that are going to love you back. So I hope you enjoyed our session. Again, I'm Jim Perko, Executive Chef for Cleveland Clinic, Center for Integrative and Lifestyle Medicine. We have multiple pro programs here that we do with all our physicians. So contact the front desk. You can make a, a culinary medicine consult appointment with me. I'm the provider for that. Uh, it's one hour for the initial visit and every follow-up visits are one hour. And you can make an appointment with our physicians and you can participate in the many of our shared medical appointments for whether it be breast cancer or culinary medicine for chronic disease. So thank you very much.